Hi, this is Peter Teuscher. I'm here with uh, Tobias Demker. We uh, are basically having a podcast that records uh, our conversations about topics that interest us as coaches and trainers, uh, and that includes everything from personal development to organizational change and leadership. And um, looking to share knowledge, uh, have some intriguing conversations, and make it as interesting as possible for people to, to listen. So how are you doing today, Toby? I'm doing great. You know, today is the first day of the year of the ox. Uh, we, we had a little bit of a Chinese New Year's ah. dinner here yesterday. So, um, yeah, we're it's, it's kind of new beginnings, uh, at least from the Chinese lunar calendar point of view. Yeah, yeah, the lunar calendar. The um, it, it it's a little different in every Asian country, right? I think uh, South Korea is a little different than China, but they all kind of work on the lunar new year, right? Well, they. Sh I mean, the lunar new year is always. It should be the same if it's in if in different countries, because it's kind of a Chinese tradition that have extended to a lot of different Asian countries. However, the according to our the Western calendar, the 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 Chinese New Year is always a little bit different each year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's usually around. Uh, I mean, sort of mid January to mid February in that kind of space. Yeah, and I think the Chinese celebrations go a little bit longer um then in some yeah it's other, typically yeah. two weeks yeah yeah okay fine unfortunately so you... i don't have two weeks holidays but... <laughs> <laughs> no well you know i live in germany and we still do uh we still do a thanksgiving over here every year um even though it's not really a thing here although i have more american friends so we we tend to do the uh american thanksgiving rather the, than the canadian one because there's they're a month apart different hmm. different background to them anyway um great so Look, that's interesting. i mean i'm just thinking the, the what we're talking about now can we connect that to to the topic at hand at some point i, I can see a vague connection a, va a vague <laughs> connection to what thanksgiving or, or chinese new year well i mean to, to either chinese new year or thanksgiving uh to the topic at hand for today i don't know if you want to disclose that. yeah right? absolutely i think that uh, this is the one this is one that's really important to me and um i've been thinking ab about for a while um and and just recently it's come up in conversation with uh, uh, some of my coaching conversations i've had and so on uh and that is um the matter of values and i think um What's, what I've realized is that values, um, people take that term for granted or people give it a lot of lip service. Um, but I, I don't know if people realize how impactful uh, values or more specifically core values are um, both on a personal level and um, in an organization. So um, what's your view on, on values in in Oh, well, I mean, it's such such a deep topic. But yeah, when I was, I mean, the reason why I was thinking about Thanksgiving or Chinese New Year and, uh, and values then um, is because it, it's it's a time when you can connect with people around you that you have. To, I mean, Thanksgiving, sure, you meet with your friends and family. Um, New Year's, Chinese New Year, it's all about family getting together. And it's it's really a good time to to get back to your roots and and reappreciate what's really important for you and, and appreciate the loved ones around you because uh, that this is something that most people value i mean we even if we're talking about a cross-cultural cross-cultural contexts um, when we have might have different values the values of love and and uh, you know for for most people at least family is a very is sort of close to heart value so it's it's the the finding these things that we share in common you know and it's it's a i reckon it's a nice warm cuddly kind of feeling emotion attached to it right <laughs> yeah it's funny that this is why i like our conversations because every time i have you know a, a topic in mind and i have a certain take on it I'll talk to you and you, you give me you give me a totally pers perspective that I hadn't even considered it from. So um, so, yeah, that's why I didn't draw the, the connection um, before. I, I think a, a, I want to bring up a question that someone recently asked me um, in, a, in a coaching conversation, which was, so what's the difference between values and something like principles? Right. And for me, um, you know, people make that connection to uh 
ethics and you know principles and i i see that as you know those are the the boundaries we've set for ourselves a lot of times where you know we, we won't cross a certain line or um you, you know it, it's a, it's a framework from which we want to um hold ourselves accountable um but i think values are much deeper so on a on a personal mm-hmm. level your core values really drive a, a significant amount of your behavior but also um, really impacts, you know, I talk a lot about happiness. It really affects your happiness but or, or, or your satisfaction because if a lot of the things you're doing are incongruent or in contrast to your core values, that will cause a great deal of sort of inner conflict. Um, and you can see that in, in, in organizations when um, they're trying to change the culture um, and they've, mm-hmm. they've recruited people who have... Uh, values that maybe are in contrast with the the new culture that they're trying to bring in, um, or when you see, you know, organizations talking about certain certain cultural values and then the behaviors don't match those. So, um, so yeah. So I think for me, you know, values on a personal level super important because of the way they drive behavior. And I, I think if anybody's interested in looking at, okay, well, what are my core values? And a lot of people don't do that. It's something that I really encourage people to do um, as we, um, you know, progress in any kind of uh, um, coaching um, environment or uh, even, you know, it, it, people in a leadership role. Because if you're not clear on your your values people have a sense of them but they've sometimes they haven't really Mm -hmm. identified them there's lots of online tools for that too you know you can kind of find your 10 um core values and then you'll 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 be able to recognize okay what are the things i'm doing in my life that are that don't that aren't in harmony with that that are somehow in Mm -hmm. contrast and then you'll start to get a sense of um well, now I know why I've been kind of unhappy or dissatisfied, or now I know why this bothers me at work and so on. And um, yeah, so from a personal perspective, but I think in a sort of in a leadership and a and a and a business environment, how have you seen sort of the uh, dysfunction that arises from sort of um, values that are you know are given lip service and, and then co- contrast that to the behaviors that you see in those organizations? Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, well, we're, we're really getting into a large scope here, but I mm. mean, the short answer, yeah, sure. <laughs> the, I mean, if you look at any kind of organization that wants to, to do any kind of a transfer, uh, transformation or cultural change, and you just at or you just change the core values a little bit uh, i mean that's lip service it's very easy to talk about yeah we're going to be more customer centric or we're going to be be having a team spirit or whatever but i mean if you have a company if, i mean i work for some some companies that are more than 100 years old and um, if you just change a slogan on the poster that doesn't really do very much right so uh, it, it is so much attached to to habits and behaviors, and especially, of course, from from the leadership level. Uh, and that co- goes into authentic leadership: how how connected your behaviors are with your uh, with your values and what you're talking about. So, if you are, you really walking the talk, as you said, right? So, for sure, it goes into to uh, both organizational. Uh, behavior, uh, organizational transformations and change, uh, leadership effectiveness, I would say. Uh, but it all starts with what where you started off. Uh, you know, what is the your personal values, your your personal journey to self-awareness, etc. Um, and like you, I've spent a lot of time on, on I've been do- doing exercises for myself and others, identifying my values, spending a lot of thoughts. It's, I think it's very difficult to do, right? And because sometimes on a certain day, I might have a certain result and think, yeah, these are my, you know, my top five values or something. A year later, it might be something else, but they shouldn't change, right? The, the, and that's the thing with the value that they go so deep. So the value should stick. I mean, you can change your behaviors, uh, but your value should stick. And I think that's, if I use that kind of kind of metaphor of uh, a value being an anchor uh, that is 
deep rooted below the 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 sea level you can't even see it right mm. and there might be a chain attached to 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 a boat on the surface um, and this boat they can it can go into different directions so you if that's the behaviors your behaviors can change according to the wind or the context but your values should be rooted but there's a very strong link between uh, your your values and your behaviors so it's i mean it's deeply rooted uh, they they should be kind of fixed um and they're they're very very difficult to change i think yeah i agree and that's why we call them core values because there's something that that's in, entrenched in you um and that they're often things that you're unconscious of that's why it's important to look at them to understand sort of what your needs are i i really think core values uh, speak to the the needs of an individual, right? And then when you can be clear on those, then you can take those into organizations. But on an individual level, um, you know, I, there there are also contrasting values, right? So there are people who who um, say, well, freedom is a real value for me, but so is security, right? And so there's this inner battle between this need for security, but this need for freedom, and the two. Um, can coexist, but they there there's interplay between those two, right? So the right mm -hmm. amount of so what's the amount of freedom you need, and how do you define that? Um, and and so there's you know there's all those kind of things, and and that's why I think it's um, it's important for people to uh, at any stage of life to to look at them. And when you say, well, you know, it depends on the state you're in or the the year, you know, the time that you're talking. Yeah, I think there. are there are different values you focus on depending on what's going on in your life at any given times uh, but mm. but i still think they're operating in the background so if you if you go too far off track from some of your core values you, you'll feel it you won't be able to maybe put your finger on you know what it is but you'll 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 have a sense of dissatisfaction unhappiness um whether it's in your um, your home life or in the relationships you have, the friendships you have, you start hearing people around you talking uh, in certain ways or, or behaving in certain ways that just rub you, like they just don't feel right. And and mm -hmm. that's where you recognize that there's, you know, this contrast between your values and theirs. Um, and that's yeah. not always a bad thing. I think it's it's good to have a diversity of people around you. But if the, if it's consistently affecting you in a negative way, then that's when it's time to look at making a change because yeah. I don't think you will change your core values. I think those are, those are there. I think, um, those are needs. And if they're not being met, you will be unhappy or dissatisfied in some way. Yeah. I don't mean, so it's, it's about definitions as well and finding commonality among, uh, among people. And I, yeah, I think it's really important to, to what, what you're saying about you know, drawing attention to your values, um, and and you can feel this discomfort. I realize that for me personally, if I'm in a situation and some something might be kind of rubbing me in the wrong way, and I I don't know, but something is making me feel uncomfortable. And typically, I feel it in my stomach. You know, it's a it's a just a feeling of discomfort in my, in my stomach, and making me a little bit unsettled, kind of. Um, and that's a real good warning signal, right? Something's going on here and, you know, it might be attached to my values uh, and then I have the opportunity to think about it and, and preferably for me, I need to talk to someone about it. I mean, I can think about it a lot, but I, for, I can kind of, kind of get stuck, right? So, I mean, if I have a coach like you or um, uh, typically I talk to my, my wife or someone closer on me and just articulating some of the emotions and some of the the thoughts that I have, and that making connecting the dots, right? Oh, I'm feeling like this because this goes against my my value of loyalty, for instance, you know. And then oh, and then it just becomes easier to to make a decision. I mean, it's not going to make the problem go away, but it's gonna it's gonna for for me. I've noticed many times that I come to the situation where oh, now I understand why I'm feeling that way. And it's just so much easier to take, uh, you know, a cognitive, rational, good quality decision based on that. So it's a really good foundation for making wise decisions for for myself personally. 
Yeah, and that's a good point that you make. I mean, not everyone is so kinesthetic where they they can identify exactly where in their body that they feel it. But I think uh, the the thing about the unconscious mind is that uh, it communicates uh, to us in feelings, like not in words. Um, you know, people will have dreams and have, um, images and stuff, and it'll be very metaphorical. But for the most part, uh, it, you know, we have that communication with that level of our consciousness on a feeling level. Um, and then we do put words to it, right? We interpret those feelings and the, and the emotions that are triggered from those feelings. Um, and, but I think the, the whole point about, um, you know, we give things labels is also important, um, uh, because, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of, you know, a few different, you know, people say that, you know, words are just, they're placeholders or Eckhart Tolle uh, talks about, how, you know, they're just pointers, you know, they, they point you to the words, the meaning, they, they don't, they don't encapsulate the meaning. And, and so I think that's important when you're giving your values labels. Sometimes we um, have a certain identity and uh, that we've created for ourselves and we associate certain things um, with that I- identity and, and sometimes those are aspirational, but those shouldn't be confused with your core values because those are mm-hmm. deeper. You can't just kind of pick and choose those, right? There, there, are, there are people who, um, you know, creativity is a real core value for them. They need to work in an environment that's always changing or th- that allows their creativity to flow, whereas other people, you know, they, they need the routine and so on. And you'll find values behind that um so so i think it's important how you what you label as your value so anybody listening who's interested in doing this that there are great online uh exercises that where it'll pop up different different values words associated with values and you continue to kind of pick and choose between two and then you'll it'll come down to your top 10 but you can even uh, do a mind map or you can even jot down you know, a whole list of different things that you think are your, your values and you can um, continually put two words together until you kind of get the ones that always come up that always win out over the other one. Um, mm-hmm. And and those doing this is a very intuitive process because like I say, the uh, the unconscious works on a feeling level. Um, so so I, I think those are good points that you made that is something you feel when when something feels off, you can you can recognize there's a behavior, or there's something going on that's in contrast with with a core value. So, um, yeah. so yeah, really helpful exercise, I think for people to do. And, it, and, and your point about, you know, it, the, these are just labels, words that we're giving things. Um, yeah, the, that's where it's important to see how does that resonate with me? Does it really feel like that's, you know, that's a need that I have? Um, or is it just mm-hmm. something that I'd like to associate with? Right. There is a difference. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, there is a very big difference. Yeah. I mean, what one, one fun little exercise that I've done in workshops sometimes is we, I I have people to to write down uh, you know it can be ten values so you start with ten post its and you write down a value for each post and that it takes a little time right you really have to think about it you know where and it can be of the context of uh, you know when think of a time in life when you were super happy and what was happening then and and you start uh, sort of writing down your post its. And then as you're standing there, I ask people to, okay, well, now you have to take one and uh, and throw it away. So you have to physically take that poster and, you know, make it to a little little ball and throw <laughs> it in the trash can. And, you know, it's a little bit fun in the beginning. But then after a while, when you're coming down to maybe five or six, it gets really uncomfortable, right? Now, this is something that's super important to me. I don't yeah. want to throw this away. <laughs> And that's where you start to feel this tension. Oh, this is really important for me. So this might be, you know, a really strong value. Um, and I mean, it doesn't give you the, the, the full, it never gives you the full picture of, of, of who you are. But it's, in my experience, it's a really fun and good exercise to create a little bit of awareness, you know, hmm, this is getting uncomfortable. So this must be really important to me. I wonder why that is, right? What a great exercise! I, I haven't done that actually. I'm going to try that for myself, and, and it's a good way to um, to have that real visceral experience where um, you know where you're giving. There's some things you aspire to, or that you know you um, you associate them with yourself. But I think when you do a process like that, where you actually can feel like, wow, uh, really taking this off my list feels wrong. Um, I think mm. that's that's quite a powerful exercise. 
interesting yeah it's uh, <laughs> it can be can be really fun actually yeah. so um i i i wanted to uh you know so we've we've talked a lot about personal values here and i did want to take the conversation today I know it's kind of unlike me because I'm usually the the personal coaching, the personal development guy. But uh, I think in terms of organizational um, uh, aspects of values, I think it's sometimes um, th that is especially where I hear people talking about values that aren't lived or aren't you know expressed in in behaviors. So um, mm. so yeah, I, I'd I'd like to take the conversation in that direction. Um, sure. And I think one area where it's really important, where people talk about, um, you know, company culture or organizational culture, and um, I always encourage people at, you know, the the top of a, a business organization, um, to really get clear on that. You'll know you, you may have a founder of a company or a CEO or the sort of the the, the senior leadership team, and and those are the people where I think need need to be aligned um what are the what are the shared values because you'll attract people to an organization based on you know uh, people i like the way Sinek, simon Sinek talks about um things in terms of you know people don't buy um what you what you do they do they buy why you do it or something to that regard and i think people mm -hmm. also join organizations because they feel there's something they have something in common they 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 see some you know whether it's some kind of purpose or whether it's the security they need or you know where whether it's the um the structure that the organization provides or the freedom uh the autonomy i think those are all things that you will attract people to your organization and so that's why when you've had an organization uh, a company for a while and you've got a certain mindset and you're trying to shift the culture what mm. what will automatically happen is if you if you force that through you'll either you know some people will adapt some people will find okay there's still enough common pieces for me some will leave and some you'll have to you know because they've just kind of become uh very kind of complacent and comfortable uh, they'll you'll have to kind of you know uh, help them leave but um i i find that that happens that that's a process when you're when you're uh, changing culturally but I, I think more in a more positive sense um if you're if you're wanting to foster a certain culture i think the first place to start is the culture the cultural values right do you agree yeah i mean as you said I mean, we're talking about organizational core values and more and more people are organizations and especially the younger generation are looking to going into a you know what we call a purpose-driven organization um and where uh where the purpose is very clear or or what we could talk about value-driven organizations where we're doing we're doing something for a purpose but there are clear values that are guiding us i mean and, and i think the problem is that any i mean if you look at most organizations you're going to have very similar kind of words for your values so you can put whatever whatever words you have on on any posters or whatever I and mean, let me take a, a a silly example maybe but you know that i spent a lot of time in china and for the last decade or so there's been a really big drive on you know promoting uh, Chinese values uh, and the communist party have their values that they put up on posters everywhere and one of the values that they're really promoting is democracy, right? And hmm. if, you, if, you see, if you see that from a Western perspective, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you don't even have democracy in China. But this, I mean, how do you define it? How do you live it? What does it mean to you? So you can have very similar words in, on different posters, but what does that mean in this particular context? Um, I mean, if you look at... Um, I, I'm just making a, a, illustrating an example here that might not be true, but if you take uh, Ford and uh, BMW, both of them might could potentially have you know um, customer uh, customer satisfaction or uh, the, that uh, the, that the customer always uh, comes first or something like that as a core value. But it's not going to look the same. It might have a little bit of a different priority. It might fit a little bit different in, say, uh, um, uh, your your uh, leadership development model or whatever. And, and if it comes out different in priorities and how you behave it, 
um, it's just it's a different feel to it. So I mean, you talked about the language aspect before that that the language can cannot really capture the true essence of a value, and it's much more of a it's a mix of language, uh, behaviors, attitudes, um, emotions, of course, right? So it's it's and it becomes very complicated. And then when you're trying to change that um, by by changing a language or changing a poster, but you're not changing your attitudes or behaviors or whatever it is, and to if it, if it's an organization of a hundred thousand people, I mean it's not an easy thing to do, right? So it's no, it just shows how how extremely difficult it is and how much time and work and effort it, it it's needed. That that's why I feel like it's it's very much a top down exercise. I think you need to get your core group of leadership together, and um, you can talk about um, your you know your um, shared values. But I think at the end of the day, you you need to ask yourself, um, you know, what kind of culture do we have? And that will that will that you you will find cultural you will find values within the kind of culture you're describing. And then then you can ask yourself, okay, how how do we know when this culture is being lived? And you'll know by the behaviors that you that are exhibited within the organization. And so the thing is, there there are the values people like to talk about, you know, that are really fun and interesting and then there's the ones that 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 people don't look at so every every company obviously has a profit motive right they there is an element of profit that is there they, they're there to make money and so um so you'll have you know if you have a company that's talking about you know being create creative and 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 um you know maybe environmentally conscious or uh, people first or whatever um but they have a but really at the leadership level they have a, a a major growth agenda well then obviously things like pace and urgency are also um values of that leadership team and need to be somehow incorporated uh in in the sort of cultural values that they want to talk about so um so that's why i think having a consensus amongst the senior leadership team talking about um, you know, being very clear on what the what the values are, and then looking at ways to um, incorporate those, and then the feedback loop is basically okay. You know, are, do we see this in our own behaviors? Um, in the examples that we set, and then the next tier of of leadership. Um, you know, how can we encourage the same behavior in them, and then and then it becomes a a bit of a trickle down effect. Um, mm. And then you also attract people to your organization. That once you start, once you start living that that um, you know that either through word of mouth or through um, the 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 messaging matches the actions of the organization. So you, you know your advertising and your marketing strategy actually is backed up by the behaviors and the way you you act in the marketplace or in the way you act to the to whatever you're trying to achieve um, then you'll start to attract the people with similar values into your organization and that solidifies that and, and makes the culture stronger so you start to bring people in and you, you start to hr starts to have discussions around are these guys a good cultural fit right but you can do mm. it in ways that you've already defined right you've already um, clearly defined what attributes you're looking for yeah yeah i mean it becomes a very i mean essential part of the the if you look at the organization from a holistic perspective and look at strategic alignment that it really fits and you create stories within the system that is aligned and congruent and i mean and you can only control it to to some extent right and then it becomes part of it's a living organism that uh, it's uh, you can try to manage and you can ha have certain control mechanism on it, but it, it I mean, it, it goes so deep into to the organizational behavior. Yeah. Uh, but it is it is core and it's so important to go into it and look at, you know, what are the core values? Are we living them and, and constantly reviewing uh, these stories that are created and then and look for ways to. Um, improve it and develop it to a sense that is uh, that is healthy for the organization, right? Yeah, well, it is a reinforcing loop that happens when you when you bring the right people in and when you're living them from a, a, at every level of an organization. But I think your point about stories is a really good one because 
you know, we that that's how we communicate. Those are the most impactful ways to convey facts. I mean, you know, I've I've heard you know, um, anthropologists talking about this, you know, that we, we come from storytelling tribes and culture. This, this is how we passed mm. on information from generation to generation. So it's in our DNA to to listen to stories in order to um, to take that information. And I think within those stories, you can, if someone tells a story about themselves and where they um, emphasize things, that's, you'll, you'll be able to pick out... Um, values within the sort of language they use and what they put emphasis on um you know what they get excited about what they uh, you know tone as being negative that's an exercise i do with individuals when we're when we're looking at uh, when i'm when i'm trying to look at you know this is from an nlp background but when uh when i'm trying to look at um sort of what core beliefs that a person has i'll look at the language they use sometimes i'll get them to well you know to to write a little um summary a couple of paragraphs talking about themselves or their lives or whatever and you can you can start to pick out the language they're using or certain words that they emphasize um and Mm. and those will point to some of their core values and you can do the same within organizations that's why i think the stories you tell and yet even today you know I think a lot of marketing departments and marketing organizations or agencies, they realize the power of storytelling. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I think, and within those stories, that's where you start to identify the values. Um, mm-hmm. The stories people tell the the uh, about the organization outwards, but uh, w- and with each other, um, they contain a lot of that information. That's a good feedback yeah. loop as well. Um, yeah, and that's where it becomes interesting when when you now because now we're talking about individual values and our individual perception of certain values or stories but also the collective aspect right so what are the values that or what are the stories that we share what what are the common values that we're sharing in this and we're it's vice versa connected right so our individual stories feed the collective stories but the collective stories and values feed our uh, individual behaviors as well so it's i mean it becomes such a powerful mechanism and and powerful f- forces uh, that are are around us and we probably don't even realize it right so it, i mean it becomes really interesting when you look at it from from that uh from the outside perspective yeah but then but then remembering what what are we talking about we're talking about fundamental anchors that are if we use that metaphor again that are are deeply rooted inside us that we barely ever really think about, right? So when 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 you look at it from that perspective and creating an awareness, it becomes truly, truly interesting. Yeah, when you start to take, when you start to really um, look at the broader picture and you look at things like um, culture within countries, right? Um, so within, so we live in Europe, you, you know, you've got... Um, maybe in Sweden you could say there there's certainly you've had immigration too but there's a, a more homogenous kind of culture like there's a very old culture that goes back you know thousands of years right because you know going back to the Vikings I guess between the Norwegians and the Swedes right um, <laughs> to some degree and then but when you look at sort of the new world like Canada where I'm from or um, uh, or the US you have um, you have this whole melting pot of different, all these different mixed cultures, and and that. Um, so I, I know there, there's. I really value the fact that I was able to grow up in Canada, and some of the values that then uh, were instilled in me because of the fact that I lived in that culture. Um, I think what we're seeing now, and when you look at some places where there's a lot of polarization. Um, mm. people don't feel like they their own values are a fit for the people around them right um, and, yeah. and so people start to to f- say you know fight for their beliefs they they, they, they um, you know they, they see a real contrast and and that makes people feel isolated and alone and you feel that incongruence and um, but that's again that's where we talked about earlier or you talked about you know where you're focusing your uh, which values are you focusing on currently? Because I, which if you look at a country like the United States, I'd say probably a, a lot of Americans have very common values 
but currently they seem to be focusing on the on those values that divide them right so um, yeah. so it, it is a matter of focus it is sort of a snapshot in, in time what the state of mind is um, and and th there is a rate like you you have um, you know a group of values that aren't all in harmony with another either like i said you know the, there's this security and freedom you know the, trying to find the balance between those two needs that you have um mm. so um so yeah i think it's interesting to look at it at, on a very large scale uh in in terms of you know culture within a um a country but within europe i find because you know these these cultures have developed over time from very regional very tribal even uh to having a national identity right and it's and there's going to be variation on that i think when mm -hmm. i look at germany the the perception of what it means to be german is going to be different in berlin than it, it certainly than it would be in munich right the bavarians yeah. have a different view of it um so do you have that in in sweden at all as well by region sure yeah of course uh, very very much so uh, i mean it can be um i love the way um i think it was hans rosling he, he he sadly passed away a few years ago but he was a yeah. swedish uh you know lecturer professor the guy who and did factfulness talked, right he was the guy yeah, who did exactly, the book yeah. factfulness yeah, yeah yeah and he was talking like when when his father grew up you know they they started fighting me if you come from from another village or something and then when he grew up, it could be if you're coming from from another part of the city or something like that. And now it's like if you're coming from another country. So <laughs> that's we we have that in Sweden. It's it's becoming a melting pot as well, which is you know which is interesting. Um, but to connect that to what you were talking about, you know, in 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 a lot of societies around us, there are a lot of common values, but that we're feeding maybe maybe different beliefs or different attitudes towards the the the, um, the values and there's a great lack of that empathy that we talked about previously and there's mm -hmm. to 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 be interested in what are your values what's important for for you what are the what is the common ground it's much easier to look at the differences you know like you're doing this or i'm doing this but what i what i'm taking away from what you're saying what i think is really interesting is is you know what because we 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 talk about values as something very personal you know these are my values and they're super important to me but what makes them mine where are they coming from mm. you know like if i'm if i'm okay i'm a swede but what what makes my values being swedish values or how are my values different from from uh chinese or american values or something like that and what why where are they coming from you know typically we talk about the values they 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 come from maybe part of his dna it's upbringing it's culture it's all of these con contextual factors around us that are for forming our values in a, in a very from a very young age um, so what makes them ours, you know, <laughs> it's, I think it's fascinating to think about that. What, what is it about values that makes them so important to, to for, for my self identification process? What, when they might be coming from my parents or from my, uh, you know, from my elementary school teacher or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't have the answer, but I think it's a really interesting thought to, thought process of, you know, what are making values or what what are the making making the values mine personal? Yeah, it's a it's a process that comes from um the same thing that um our beliefs are are established from I I think we we grow up and we have experiences and we interpret the you know something happens and we all, we may all have a different take on it. So we we have events that happen in our lives, experiences that we have that then we interpret. Um, and depending on how they make us feel, we develop a strategy on how to deal with those feelings, right? Or maybe it's external, deal deal with the situation. Um, and, and from that, we develop certain needs. So there are deal breakers. There are things that we want to have. Uh, and then and but could live without but there are things that are essential needs for us and i think that is at the core of what um core values are is is, is they are the deal breakers for us you know uh, for if we have to live in contrast to our values for any extended periods 
um, it, 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 I think it does something negative to the human psyche. That's, yeah. that's my opinion. But um, I, I think that's why you can't, you, you suffer if you work in an organization for any extended period that, that is in complete contrast with your values. Um, and, and, and that's why sometimes, you know, people will have to uh, bury or subdue or uh, distract themselves from how they're feeling because they don't want to address the fact that, you know, the, the behaviors they have or the situation that they're living in is in contrast with the values that they that they developed at a, a fairly young age. I think that um, those those core values come at a fairly young age. I think they become more prominent as you grow older. I mean, obviously, experience reinforces the beliefs that we have. Um, exactly. Yeah. And and then you you start to recognize where your values um, as you experiment as you go through life. You you start to you know what feels right, what doesn't feel right, and and so yeah. I th I think it's a complex process. Um, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, a, a psychologist, so um, I'm sure um, you could get a, a, a lot better professional um, answer to that. But but certainly, I think a lot of those elements are there. It's the strategies that we uh, developed from when we were at a young age. It's the experiences mm -hmm. that reinforce those opinions that we and those perceptions that we developed, and then we we start to recognize what our emotional needs are, and and mm -hmm. I think our values really speak to that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I guess it is a, a process where, and I, I really agree with that that our experience sort of enhance our, our our perceptions of our values, etc. Um, and typically, I mean, the the saying is that you can't really change your values. I mean, of course, you can't change them a little bit, or your context can can reprioritize them, etc. But you can change your behaviors. Um, um, but I'm yeah, I'm. I'm I'm curious to to look into a little bit more about you know what how how do you if you see uh, 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 the change in your personal values what forces can 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 make that happen you know you know what what are the the events and it's probably quite I mean you talked about getting into psychology yeah, we're not psychologists but I mean uh, traumatical experience etc might re, re uh, shift our values, etc. But typically, I mean, the what I'm saying is that the, the the usual saying is that changing a value is something that is um, very very difficult and maybe impossible to do. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess depending on how entrenched it is, they you know, the, from a psychological standpoint, the the thinking seems to be that you know, you kind of, from a personality standpoint, you are who you are kind of around the age of 11. So you, you've, um, it's also around the age where you, where you no longer learn through imitation, you start to cognitively, um, rationalize, uh, you know, things, process things a little bit differently. But so they say that unless you have one, have a trauma, um, or you do some really deep work, uh, with, a a therapist, a coach, or, you know, you, you, you do some personal development stuff, you go on retreats. Those are kind of things that will, um, that, that can change a person's personality. And so everything that's associated that with that, you know, your behaviors, your thinking patterns. Um, and so, so yeah, I think it's not impossible to change, but I think it, it's very difficult because those become embedded in you at a very early age and you're not cognizant of them. I mean, you don't think about your core values a, a lot. And so when, um, but you feel it, right? You feel when you're mm. not, um, when there's incongruence, when you're in, con in contrast to, to your values. And, and, and you see, look, you see dysfunction in the world. You see a lot of unhappy people. And um, I think that's, that's an area that people can start to look at just like you see dysfunctional organizations and you can start to recognize that, um, well, there's, there's a real, you know, the, the, the values that they're espousing are not the ones they're living. And that contrast is causing dysfunction. People are unhappy. People are frustrated. I work, you know, I've worked in, in corporate environments where, you know, they had, they have slogans on the walls, but, um, you know, like tenacious and, you know, uh, all these really, um, ambitious slogans, and yet um, mm -hmm. there was a culture of 
you know, uh, mistakes are punished, watch your back, lots of layoffs. So you never know when your turn is around the corner. And so the, the real thinking and, and feeling environment was so at odds with the, the purported, you know, culture or the words they were trying to use. And that, that goes to your point. You can't describe, you can't, you can't just put a bunch of slogans up and expect that to create your culture for you. Right. Um, and if you're, yeah. If you're um, at the senior level or, you know, and, and, and people, I've met a lot of top level leaders that are just in denial about it because, you know, their agenda is they have a, they have, they have to hit profit targets. They have, you know, they have a board to report to and they have shareholders to be accountable to. And, and really, you know, sometimes they just see the whole culture thing as a HR exercise and don't take it seriously <laughs> enough. Right. I mean, yeah. you and I have both experienced that. So, um, so yeah, it takes buy-in on a lot of levels. But it, it, if people don't respect and um, and appreciate how much values really impact how well your organization runs, I think you're really missing something big. And you shouldn't you shouldn't wonder why there's so much, so much dysfunction in your organization if you haven't addressed mm -hmm. that problem. Yeah, <clears throat> the, there is this famous famous story that I've heard from in many very, very different versions by this time. But, you know, there's uh, this person who goes into an office and tries to solve a problem because the, the client has an issue with uh, uh, with a collaboration. You know, like collaboration is one of our values and we need to cooperate and collaborate much more in the organization. And he's sitting in the, the office of the CEO and behind him, there's a chart of each branch of the office, how they're competing to, against each other, <laughs> you know, like who's number one, who's number two, et cetera. Yeah. So like making sure that your processes are, are aligned with, uh, with, your, with your cultural values and or your core values, that's probably a good starting point. But yeah. I mean, it's not so easy to, to see because you're, you're, as we talked about before, you're, you're, entrenched in this really complex system whereas there there's opinions and figures to hit milestones and, and processes around you and it's it's really difficult to get a a good holistic view of what we're doing and and if things are aligned so yeah. it's um, it's easy to say for an out from an outside perspective but i mean when you're inside an organization maybe it's not so easy to see it no, I agree. I, I I think that's why it often gets overlooked. Um, but that that's a perfect example that you just gave there because how many companies talk about teamwork? Uh, you know, we we're big on teamwork, and then um, the 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 individual uh, KPIs that they give people, you know, put them in competition with one another at at odds with yeah. another. And, you know, they have comp <laughs> you know, they they their competing interests do not support teamwork. Um, mm -hmm. and so, I mean, that's just one example, but there, there's just so many different ways where, um, different departments or different individuals are put at odds with each other and, you know, some healthy competition, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've, um, played sports and there, there is a certain degree of motivation that comes from healthy competition. Um, but it, it needs to be looked at very carefully that the competition or, you know, um, is not at odds with one of the values like teamwork or cooperation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, conflicted KPIs, that's one of the most common, <laughs> common complaints that I run into in any organization. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. And especially when it comes to cross-functional col collaboration. But, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I guess, uh, maybe as we, as we start to wrap this up, I I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you know, we've talked about some ways for people to to individually look at and discover their core values. Um, and I encourage everyone to do that, especially if you're feeling dissatisfied and you can't figure out why. Uh, that's that, that's a really good place to start. What about you? What is there anything else that you'd like to leave people with in terms of um, maybe whether it's organizational or whether it's on a leadership level, um, you know, the, the benefits of, of really getting clear on your values and, and how to sort of communicate those. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I think to, to wrap it up, I mean, we can, we can say that, yeah, having or creating some self-awareness about your, uh, about your personal values is, is really helpful in, 
it, it can be, of course, in your personal life, but also if you're in a position where you're influencing others, which most people are, right? So <laughs> from a leadership perspective, it's really important to to have that self-awareness about your your values and making not making sure, but really making an effort to making sure that your your uh, actions or your behaviors are aligned with your with your values, and uh, and that goes from an organizational point of view, from a leadership perspective, I think from from personal uh, perspective, and also I think what is really important for me is having that that self awareness. If I'm feeling that that part of my stomach that's saying some intuitively I'm feeling that something is not right here and then connecting that to my values. You know, yeah, it, it might be that it's against my value of loyalty or, or whatever. And, and then that, that creating awareness of that process facilitates the process of, of wise decision making. I think for me, that's the, that's the real key point. Absolutely. I think the, the point about decision making, um, making choices that are right for the individual and for an organization. And I agree. I think you, at every area of life, values play a big role within the family unit, uh, in, in you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one rela like relationships between two people and then in organizations. So I'd say anybody who's... Uh, and also, sorry, sorry yeah. just to, to that point. Also in... Uh, in in a situation where you're working together or living together, I mean, if it's a, in a in a relationship, having an awareness of the differences of values as well. You know, I can get super. I, I can feel that nudge in my stomach when my wife might do something that that goes against my values. But then I have to realize that you know she has her values, and and I mean that that being an area of conflict management or. Or, or not getting into a conflict because of, of empathy that we talked about before, right? But understanding that people might have different values as well or different priorities of values. So yeah. I think it, it goes a long way for the empathy that we talked about before as well. Yeah, because you guys both come from different cultures, right? So, um, so that, 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 that's a really important one. I, again, going back to the point about looking at what people have in common, um, as well as what you you know what you what different values have and 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 when you look at values in terms of they are personal needs they are needs that you have that um, are important to be aware of and that you want other people to respect and um, be considerate of and I think that will make for healthier relationships make individuals happier in their workplace and make more functional workplaces and organizations so. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that those are all really, really important. So have you got anything else to add or should we wrap it up here? Uh, I mean, to be honest, I think we could, we could continue to talk about values in, in different, in different ways. And I'm pretty sure that in our future discussions, we'll, we're going to touch about values uh, again in some way or another, but as for the conversation today, I think that's a pretty good space to, to wrap it up. Actually, Great. So, it's always interesting to see where it takes us. You, yeah. know? You, you never know, but it's it's always fun. Yeah. I mean, these are spontaneous conversations we have uh, based on our experience and sort of the thoughts of the day. So, um, so yeah, it's some, sometimes it's a bit random, but I, I think uh, I always enjoy the conversation. I hope people listening also do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd like to leave people just with the message that, you know, if um, – if there are things that you're not like really on a feeling level, not feeling a good, good about in your workplace, in your relationship, on a personal level, it, it's time to, to have a good look at your core values um, and just have a look at, you know, where are there contrasts around you in your life, in your thoughts, in, you know, in, in the environment you're immersed in that are contrasting your values and you'll start to have a pretty good idea of why you're unhappy or dissatisfied or not feeling great. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, if you're looking to contact uh, um, Tobias, you can do it through LinkedIn, right? That's the best place yeah. to reach out to you. Uh, that's probably the easiest, yeah. And, and for me, uh, you can find me on my website, petertorscher.com. We would love to get your feedback, comments, any suggestions uh, on topics you'd like us to co cover and discuss. Um, again, you know, we're coaches, trainers, uh, um, people who've worked uh, on, indiv on individual levels, uh, both with people privately, but also in business. Um, so um, 
hopefully we have some good uh, insights and experience that we can bring to the table if uh, anybody wants to reach out. So I'll leave it at that. Toby, thanks again for joining uh, me here for this conversation. Always appreciate your thanks insights. Peter. It's always yeah, an enjoyable sweet, conversation. Um, and uh, enjoy your weekend uh, in sunny, snowy. Is it sunny in Sweden or is it just snowy? It's uh, it's pretty sp- sunny. It's been really good weather, cold, yeah. yeah, but snowy. So it's good winter weather, yeah. Hamburg, uh, we were um, minus 12 or something overnight. And uh, it, it's, it's funny because I've kind of missed it. We've had a, a few years of not having this. So... Yeah. I, uh, I, I really love the seasons. So it, that's a, a value for me, I, uh, having, having the seasons uh, in the city that I live. So, Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. We won't ramble on about the weather, but we will um, be back again in, uh, in short time to discuss and talk about another hopefully interesting topic. And until then, um, we hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot. Oh, thanks, bye.